Heavy fighting continues in parts of Gaza, particularly to the southeast of Gaza City, uh, as the besieged enclave was hit by another comms blackout and dozens more were killed in strikes overnight, both in Gaza as well as the West Bank. The Rafah border crossing was opened briefly to allow five or six hundred foreigners, uh, those with dual citizenship and those who are severely wounded or unwell, uh, to exit to Egypt, but again, very small numbers. Are we any closer today to relief for the millions still under the Israeli siege? And this week, General Motors and the United Auto uh, Automobile Workers uh, Union reached a deal that mirrored agreements between the union and other major manufacturers, including Ford and Stellantis, which is, of course, the parent company of brands like Ram, Jeep and Chrysler. Uh, these are the Detroit Big Three. Uh, we recap the historic deal. Uh, will this make a difference to ununionized automakers like Tesla next up. And our final story for the day, India's top court is hearing arguments on a batch of petitions challenging the constitutional validity of a government scheme to keep donations to political parties via electoral bonds, anonymous and outside the purview of India's Right to Information Act. Why is this legal battle important ahead of upcoming general elections? Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Dani. And before we go any further into the show, take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. As I was saying, uh, Earlier overnight, uh, refugee camps uh, have been hit uh, once again. Uh, dozens of people have been killed. Uh, communications block, uh, uh, blackout, sorry, uh, was experienced once again. Uh, we'll start as we have been uh, with Abdul giving us an update on, what's, uh, on what reports are coming in from the ground uh, in Gaza first, uh, and then move on to uh, what's happening to sort of uh, mitigate the impact of uh, Israel's continued onslaught, uh, day 26 uh, of uh, the total war uh, against Gaza. 11,000 strikes have hit Gaza in that time, according to uh, the Israeli uh, Defense Ministry. Uh, Abdul, what's the latest? Well, uh, it won't be that latest, but of course, if you see the, what happened in Jabalia uh, camp uh, on, uh, on basically on Tuesday evening, which has led to the killing of some, there are different reports which are indicating somewhere between 200 to 400 people have been killed uh, in the last, uh, uh, in that bombing, which was basically, uh, basically in the middle of a, a, a very densely populated uh, refugee camp where around 600,000 people live. And more people, of course, were living because, the, because of the displacement which has happened uh, due to the bombing in different other parts of the uh, of Gaza uh, Gaza Strip, so uh, it has led to a massive number of people, uh, a massive number of casualties, which of course also basically it is you can say it has it has been multiplied uh, uh, with the attacks on uh, in and around the hot hospitals, Indonesian hospital, Al Shifa hospitals, uh, with. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, ground offensive, which is already ongoing, particularly in the northern part of uh, Gaza. Uh, as per the latest report, there are, of course, claims and counterclaims. Israeli security forces have uh, accepted that uh, 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 more than a dozen of his soldiers have been basically killed in the fight with the Palestinian resistance movement inside the uh, inside Gaza. So. Uh, uh, on, it seems that the war in Gaza, there is no uh, uh, break in it. There is no kind of, uh, even the scaling down is not uh, 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 possible. In fact, today, the Palestinian Telecommunication uh, Authority announced that there is another uh, a kind of blackout. There is no telecommunication. There is no internet in the region, which if we see what happened uh, during the last such blackout, it, it means there is going to be some kind of escalation in Israeli bombing in the next few hours. And that basically means that Israel has no uh, uh, has not paid any attention 
to the concerns raised by all the uh, regional, uh, local, and international uh, country uh, countries and the groups uh, asking uh, to kind of some kind of uh, uh, break, some kind of human humanitarian pause uh, in Gaza. The, if you see the number of uh, people, uh, overall number of people, according to some estimates, have crossed nine thousand people being killed uh, in the in Gaza uh, alone. And we are not talking about the occupied West Bank, where uh, again uh, on Tuesday there was an escalation. Jenin has been repeatedly attacked, mm -hmm. uh, and four, uh, three more Palestinians were killed yesterday. And we have seen pictures, which are of course not confirmed, not verified, that how. Uh, Palestinians arrested have been humiliated, uh, tortured uh, uh, in cam on camera uh, by the Israeli forces. So all these things are basically creating a kind of situation which is which is basically uh, uh, sh showing that the war in Gaza at this time is unprecedented. Uh, there is an uh, the assault is unprecedented and it is it is going to be it, it continues to be one of the biggest war in the region uh in in the history of the region yeah uh, i think uh, we as uh, media have i've often been uh, accused abdul of reducing uh you know palestinian deaths to to mere numbers and statistics but it has to be noted that over eight and a half thousand uh, people now have been killed and that number will continue to grow as uh, you know the, the locations of some of these strikes are cleared up and and rescue workers uh, continue to reach those who are uh, stuck under uh, some of those destroyed buildings and other infrastructure. Uh, many uh, thousands of these, uh, I think over three and a half thousand or so uh, children among them. Uh, some uh, diplomatic pressure, of course, is mounting on Israel, uh, Abdul, even though uh, it's not been enough to get anything to change on the ground, despite the brief opening of the border crossing at Rafah. Nothing substantial taking place, uh, but Bolivia, uh, the first nation to cut off diplomatic ties with Israel over the war in Gaza. A couple of other countries uh, have asked Israel to recall its envoy, its ambassador to that country. Uh, will, will this prove significant? Are we sort of adding up uh, drops in to, to make a bucket uh, in order to get some kind of change to happen? Or, or is it uh, all coming too slow, Abdul, and there will be nothing left to save by the time the international community comes around to, to actually uh, doing anything concrete? Well, uh, I am not very hopeful, hopeful when it comes to uh, saying that whether this uh, diplomatic initiatives uh, and very uh, welcome di diplomatic initiatives will have any uh, impact on the Israeli uh, uh, strategy uh, or the Israel Israel's attempt to kind of create a, a kind of commit a large uh, uh, mass massacre in the uh, occupied uh, Gaza. Uh, primarily because if you see the statements uh, made after what Bolivia, uh, after Bolivia announced uh, the withdrawal of uh, its ambassador and kind of cutting the diplomatic ties, uh, of course, Chile, Colombia, and other countries have also followed uh, uh, the example. They have not completely cut off the diplomatic relations, but at least they have uh, recalled their ambassadors uh, for consultation, which can be a process towards taking uh, uh, initiatives like cutting complete diplomatic ties with Israel. But what Israeli government, uh, uh, government's response was, it was that uh, Netanyahu says that Bolivia has surrendered in front of uh, terrorism. And therefore, uh, this hardly makes any impact on what Israel is going to do uh, or is, going, uh, is doing in Gaza. So uh, that is one. Even Turkey, for example, which has taken, which has a very old uh, relationship with Israel, and it has sustained despite all the up and downs in the Palestinian history in the last 70, 75 years. Um, uh, there has been strong statements given by Erdogan uh, following the Gaza offensive, uh, the war in Gaza. Uh, Israel is basically has kind of started uh, uh, saying that uh, Erdogan's positions are problematic. It, it, it very much was on, uh, 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 it is very much, very much anti Semitism. And we have to, uh, in fact, Israel may take uh, initiative to uh, have some kind of diplomatic rapture uh, with uh, um, uh, with uh, Turkey. Turkey. So uh, 
uh, if you see, this is uh, the condition. Even the U.S. Uh, officials saying some days back how that uh, the reactions which are coming from different uh, state uh, officials, whether it is from Saudi Arabia or whether it is from Arab other Arab, Arab countries, Jordan, so and so forth, which have very close relationship with Israel. Even those reactions are categorized as anti-Semitism. So that basically uh, shows that there is complete uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, an, an attempt to uh, wash it all the all those criticisms as something anti-Semitism and uh, uh, and continue with its uh, uh, quote unquote war uh, on on Gaza. If you see, uh, and that basically the more this is happening, more uh, there is a fear of uh, uh, a regional escalation as well. Escalation and expansion. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just to kind of say that what happened, uh, uh, what is happening in Rafa, that uh, opening of the border for 500 people who have yeah. uh, uh, a kind of dual citizenship, they have passports for two different countries, can move out now, is basically, it happened after so much, uh, for last 20, 25 days pressure, that happened, but only for 500 to 600 people. Mm. It shows that uh, uh, the amount of diplomacy which is required to do all, all such things. So this level of hopelessness, when it comes to uh, the failures of international diplomacy to kind of put pressure on Israel to do something, leads to a kind of a, a, a kind of a sense of depression, a kind of a desperation among those who are who are feeling helpless and uh, seeing children dying, uh, uh, helpless uh, citizens dying. Uh, entire uh, localities being uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 smashed to the ground and so on and so forth, that creates a desperation. And that what ex that's how we can see uh, why Houthis, for example, had announced that they are at war with, now at war with Israel. They have fired, they had fired missiles in the last week also, but they are saying that they have fired missiles and drones targeting uh, the southern uh, uh, Gaza, uh, sorry, Southern Israel, exactly. uh, 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 basically, uh, and that bas uh, uh, is one thing. Of course, Hezbollah is already uh, uh, engaged with the Israeli occupation yeah. in one way or another. There are attacks on uh, increasing attacks, despite U.S. Uh, uh, targeting uh, uh, Syrian military install inst uh, installations in uh, inside Syria uh, uh, last week. Uh, there has there has been reports that the today uh, sorry on uh, on Wednesday for example um, there had been at least three uh, Tuesday and Wednesday within 24 hours at least one, uh, three different attacks on three different uh, base uh, bases some uh, um, bases inside Syria and in other parts of the West Asia in the last 24 hours and that basically shows that the level of uh, desperation which is uh, sinking in among the people who are basically feeling helpless in in front of complete uh, inability of uh, uh, diplomacy international diplomacy to influence the behavior of israel uh, in gaza all right abdul thank you for updating us on on a grim situation that gets worse actually every time uh, we speak to you uh, and and we will of course, ask you to hang in there and, and join us again tomorrow for another update uh, on the situation. Uh, but we'll move on now to our next story uh, for the day, which comes from the United States. We're talking, of course, about uh, the major uh, strike by the United Auto Workers Union, which has led to historic now tentative agreements with the three main uh, auto manufacturers in Detroit. That's General Motors, uh, Ford, as well as... Stellantis. Uh, Anish has been covering this story from the start. We, of course, reported previously on the first agreement that that uh, came uh, into uh, force, I guess. Uh, these agreements still have to be ratified, but it's a major win for auto workers, a 25% increase uh, in base pay, uh, as well as cost of living adjustments. Uh, the biggest gains that uh, auto workers have won after some serious struggle uh, in more than two decades. Uh, now all the auto majors are following suit. Um, Anish, uh, we'll go across to Anish uh, for more details on this historic deal. Anish, uh, so General Motors, the last of the, the three Detroit uh, majors to kind of uh, fall in line and, and, and you know, sort of mirror the deals earlier uh, agreed, 
uh, with Stellantis uh, as well as uh, Ford. Um, recap for us, uh, you know, we, we've covered, of course, the, the first of the tentative agreements uh, in detail. But recap it for us because it really is uh, an important deal uh, that auto workers have, have taken more than two decades uh, to, to win back for them. And also put into some context, Anish, because uh, I've seen some report, uh, reportage on, on what's been happening and, and many uh, media outlets are kind of describing it as generosity, the most generous deal that has been offered to auto workers. Why, why is that? Why does that uh, kind of might it? trouble you <laughs> a little, little. <laughs> uh yeah let's begin with the deal uh in that uh, because i think uh, these are some important victories uh that uh, close to around 250000 workers have won in the united states and it clearly shows uh this kind of resolve uh that these workers have gone through to actually get this deal as well uh, we're looking at uh, at the very minimum uh, you know at the top uh, incomes being uh, raised by 25% uh, over the next 5 years uh, it may not seem much but it is obviously a lot of uh, and obviously it is uh, lesser than the 40% that was promised but if you actually look at uh, the cost of living adjustment that has been brought back we have pointed this out in when we discussed the four deal as well Mm -hmm. uh when the uh, with the cost of living adjustment it can actually go to more than uh 33% uh increase over the next 5 years and that can actually uh that can be actually a handsome uh wage hike that uh, possibly auto workers in the US could actually think of right now uh at the same time uh we also have to look at some of the other factors uh with uh, you know promises to uh you know to save jobs to or to uh, retain workers and to not uh, you know cost uh, them their jobs for you know this move into electro electric vehicles uh, that these uh, companies are planning to do um, to actually make way for more jobs over the time and also to uh, and most importantly to actually also include uh, unorganized or you know contract workers uh, contract workers may not be unorganized, but like their contract workers are those who do not have, uh, you know, a set contract uh, or are permanent workers uh, like the other ones uh, and uh, do not have access to, say, healthcare uh, or, you know, any kind of contributions for pensions and retirement plans uh, by the companies. So mm. this uh, is definitely a, a major victory for them as well. Uh, Ford deal, at least. Uh, there was an expected 150% increase that would be expected for the next five years. Uh, in the case of, uh, you know, uh, the other ones, you actually have 75, at the very least, 75% increase over the next five years. So that's a ma massive uh, uh, you know, victory that cannot be, uh, you know, down down. So obviously, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And that uh, is something that we see with the media report as well. Uh, they, uh, most of them are surprised that this actually became possible because mm -hmm. most of them expected the companies to stand their ground, uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, to be set in their contracts that they had op uh, offered earlier. Uh, but obviously, they all of them relented. And that clearly shows that workers' mobilizations are you know the the reason why this uh, these contracts were there. So the attempt is now to downplay the fact that the mobilization happened or the effect of the mobilization on these deals, and uh, you know to turn it into some kind of generosity. Obviously, that is an attempt, uh, but nevertheless, it is something that they cannot uh, you know overlook. They cannot uh, overlook the kind of victory that has been uh, taken by the workers. Uh, something that is rightfully there, something that uh, they earned it because they made sacrifices as well. Most of the, uh, most, uh, the fact that workers in their previous contracts had given up on cost of living adjustments so that these companies could become profitable really speaks for itself. And the fact that they are actually taking it back uh, shows that uh, you know, their needs are something that they are not going to forego, uh, no matter what the companies would think of them. Yeah, in many cases, uh, for the companies to survive and continue to be competitive in the face of uh, Japanese and Korean automakers and such. 
um, and, and now uh, being portrayed as a magnanimous uh, management uh, that, that is giving out these uh, handsome uh, wage hikes to, to the workers. Uh, Anish, uh, two important questions. One, one, uh, and and we'll, we'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Uh, but one, uh, the Biden kind of threw his hat in the ring uh, on the side of uh, the striking workers, uh, which some political commentators called a risk. Why is it still risky for a democratic sitting president to be associated with a strong uh, labor movement uh, ahead of an election? That too. Uh, and then we can maybe talk about a little bit about the impact this will have on non-unionized uh, workers in the auto industry for working like company at some of those big, let's say, Japanese companies or companies like uh, Tesla, which of course is owned by Elon Musk. Uh, in the case of Biden uh, participating in the picket line, obviously it was a calculated risk if if it's a risk to begin with but uh, there is something that was made clear over the past few elections that uh, the working class will not stand by and uh, keep voting democratic uh, the democratic party uh, every time they actually you know uh, betray the workers every chance they can get so the fact that somebody like biden who is has always been this establishment democrat uh, who has always uh, been pro corporate uh, and if you look at his entire career as a, as a lawmaker, as a politician, his uh, stand has always been quite clear. It has never been for the workers or for uh, supporting them for their unionization, for their mobilization. But the fact that somebody like him was pushed to actually come out in support, even if it was a, it was for a photo of, clearly speaks for the kind of mobilization that we're seeing. And we have spoken about this quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit on this show that uh, working class mobilization in the U.S. is something that is now effectively irre irreversible to the point where you are actually seeing, as, you, uh, as we would talk about uh, unorganized labor, uh, people across uh, different sectors, uh, sectors that never really had uh, trade union movements to begin with or any kind of traditional tra uh, labor movement to begin with, and even they, uh, them coming up to actually mobilize, calling for unionization, calling for wage hike, calling for a uh, hike, uh, minimum, uh, federal minimum wage law, which is something that is yet to be achieved. Uh, all those things uh, are something that, uh, uh, you know, the fact that working class are now mobilizing as working class is something that is that cannot be undone at this point because that sort of militancy is not going anywhere. And the, obviously UAW victory is won. We saw with Hollywood uh, workers, uh, it, uh, similar kind of strikes happening in different kind of sectors, including Amazon, uh, where unionization is now happening. So it is uh, definitely an attempt to, you know, boost, uh, uh, at least by the trade unions, to boost uh, working class morale to actually keep fighting and to keep, uh, you know, winning. If, even if they do not win battles, uh, they can still, uh, you know, keep unionizing and that mobilization is going to actually pay results over time. And this, uh, you know, the president coming in to stand in the picket line is something that just is uh, uh, the cherry on top, like, because it actually has become commonplace where you see workers striking, workers unionizing and mobilizing in the manner that it, it never happened uh, in the last two, three decades or four decades even. Uh, and that is something that clearly should... And just to uh, end this segment, we actually also need to talk about how the contracts, all three contracts, uh, will be expiring on April 30th, uh, 2028, because uh, the UAW wants the workers to go on strike on uh, Labor Day on May 1st. So this actually is, and, and actually exhorting all trade unions and workers' movement to do the same. Uh, so that workers can actually have the you know have the chance to uh, go go on a strike on a nationwide strike on Labor Day, clearly shows that there is this you know very working class solidarity that is coming back in a big way in the United States. Strong to take back some of the world's largest economy uh, by those who are of course building it. Thanks very much, Anish, uh, for an update on, on these uh, quite major developments in the labor movement in the US. Uh, and with that, we'll move on to our final story for the day, which is uh, from India, where the top court, uh, the Supreme Court, as it's known, 
uh, is hearing uh, arguments on a batch of petitions. India has a system called public interest litigation whereby anyone can approach the top court on a matter that is deemed of significant uh, impact to a large number of people in the country. In this case, the hearings are on the issue of funding of political parties, particularly the scheme uh, relating to uh, electoral bonds, which allow anonymous donations and also keep uh, donations to political parties outside of the purview of the country's Right to Information Act. Uh, so therefore, people, uh, the media and other organizations that keep tabs and scrutiny uh, do not actually know how political parties and who uh, funds political parties, how they receive their funding, how much funding they receive. Uh, India, of course, is also going in for an important general election in 2024. So these hearings have uh, a great deal of uh, immediate also uh, context and, and, and not just in terms of uh, larger constitutional or political structure uh, issues. Uh, Pragya will be joining us. Let's go over to her now to get the details on what uh, five judges of the Indian Supreme Court, including the Chief Justice of India, uh, are hearing from uh, a number of opposition parties, of course, who are represented in these public interest litigations. Pragya, good to have you with us on uh, Daily Debrief. For those of us who might not be that familiar with what's going on uh, in India, tell us first what the scheme is all about and, and why uh, this litigation at the Supreme Court uh, to question its constitutional validity. Siddhant, absolutely. You know, uh, 2018, uh, not long before the 2019 national elections, the Indian government in introduced a scheme. Uh, the scheme was basically to allow anonymous donors to give money as they wish to political parties of their choice. Now, uh, this was questioned from the get-go by those who watch uh, the election process in India. Uh, you know, they basically said that the anonymity of the scheme, which is supposedly meant to protect the identity of the person who's giving money to a political party of his choice, is actually uh, a, a sort of selective autonom uh, anonymity. You know, it, it is anonymous to the opposition parties and the public, but it's not so anonymous for the uh, government in power and the political party in power. And so, you know, this litigation actually started with the Association for Democratic Reforms, which is a very well-known, uh, you know, uh, non-government organization in India, which pursues, as its name suggests, uh, freedom of expression, transparency. Those are the kind of issues that they raise. And they joined forces with a bunch of other people to basically approach the Supreme Court. The case has sort of languished for five years, but now it's come to the stage where it's being heard uh, this week. So uh, interestingly, the Supreme Court has made some initial observations. I don't know whether these, uh, you know, these will refer, these it will refer to again in the final judgment or what the court will decide. But it has essentially said that well, well this is selective uh, transparency and selective, uh, you know, anonymity, and it is leaning towards the to benefit the party in power. Right. Uh, and, and why is that uh, fundamentally problematic, uh, Pragya? Let's say uh, you are a political party that happens to be in power. I'm a person that has uh, money to spare and perhaps uh, wants, uh, you know, uh, some something from the government. Uh, and so I can give you money and you know uh, that I am giving you money, but nobody else does. Why does that create uh, problems in an electoral democracy such as India? It, it does immediately just... Uh, at first look, just the very idea that people will not know who is funding which party means that they will not know who is influencing which government and in what way. That's the basic precept here. But there are other issues. India has had a concern with black money, uh, you know, money which is, you know, of uh, for which taxes have not been paid, whose sources of income are, have not been disclosed properly. And so because the electoral bond scheme functions through the banking system, one bank, a national bank, has been designated to accept electoral bonds. So the impression is created that there's transparency and that there is also white money, money in the banking channel. 
Right, but it may not be money which is from earned from legitimate sources. And then, of course, the influence on policy has become more and more of a problem because of the lack of transparency in general governance. There are laws which are passed suddenly, leaving people wondering why, laws with far-reaching consequences for citizens. So, so therefore, there, you know, one of the basic precepts of Indian democracy is the voting process. Now, that's free and fair, largely and broadly. People go, they cast their vote, and they're happy about the outcome, or not happy, whatever, but they know that they voted for the party they choose. What is happening behind the veil, behind the system of the who are the leaders close to, who do they like, who do they dislike, and how does it influence policies? That's what we don't know, and that's where the electoral bond system comes in. And ultimately, there is a bit of a concern that there's a slight climate of fear created by, uh, you know, uh, the lack of transparency. If you give X political party money and Y political party does not like it, what happens? This power to know lies with the government. So there are a series of issues uh, which electoral uh, bonds, secret electoral bonds raise, and it, it's going to play a critical role in uh, def- defining which party gets how much money as we run up, uh, as we as we are already in the run up to uh, several crucial state elections and the national another uh, national election next year. The thing is that initially the electoral bonds bond scheme was clear just for the looks about the national election, right. but over time it has been opened up, you know, sort of selectively for other uh, smaller state elections, etc. So. Even in how the government is planning out, rolling out the scheme, there is a lack of transparency. Is it is it that they need money or more money or extra money and or they you know uh, so they just open up a window and take money? Uh, it's it's all very hazy and so it makes the entire functioning of Indian democracy also equally hazy. All right, we must forget day two of uh, these hearings at India Supreme Court uh, on Wednesday, and we'll hopefully have Pragya back. Uh, for an update uh, if and when that court uh, delivers uh, any kind of uh, substantial verdict on the subject. That's all we have on the show today from Pragya, myself and the entire team at People's Dispatch. As always, thanks very much for watching. If you want details on these stories and all of the other work we do, all you have to do is head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And don't also forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, thank you for watching, stay safe, goodbye.